Welcome back to Khan Vision. Today's guest is Gail. Gail used to be a social worker, a counselor, and she's going to talk about some of the experience that she has had as a counselor. Stay tuned and you know what it is, Khan Vision podcast. Check it out. Thank you for coming in a short notice basically. How many days? 2 3 days? Yeah, but I love to talk. Okay. <laughs> so you came to the right place. Yes. Um for people who don't know you or me, how did we meet up? You want to tell that? Uh we met at Inka place in Kajervinen. She's a, a mutual friend and I think it was over a dinner that Yes, an African dinner. Yes. It was awesome food. It was awesome food. Like my expectation for that invitation or party was like, mm, you know, let's see what happens, but it turned out to be so much better than what I expected. I was expecting it to be great. Don't get me wrong, <laughs> but it was so much more because I get to know you and so many other interesting people. And what made that uh meeting or that gathering special was that we were different kind of people with different stories different ideas but still we could sit down and listen to one another without being interrupted and try to understand each other and i did learn a lot uh, especially from you and i was like this conversation needs to be recorded so uh-huh. that's why you are here and you're going to be always here you know this is a sp- place for you know people like you and me you know who likes to talk and has uh, interesting things to share so tell us a little bit about you what did you used to do or what you do right now well right now i'm retired after some 45 years of work or maybe even more i've lived in finland over 45 years yes so i usually tell people it can be done <laughs> <laughs> it can be done. And I was on my fourth profession. Okay. Uh the first work I did in Finland was working in the hotel and restaurant business yes. as a cook, as a as a dishwasher, as a cleaner, everything under the What sun. What kind of food were you making? Ah, uh, all kinds, mostly Finnish food and Okay. Peruna. <laughs> yeah, lots of lots of potatoes. Yes, yes, yes. But I like potatoes. I don't know about you. Yeah, I like potatoes. Yeah. Although I remember when I went to cooking school, they said potatoes have vitamin C. And I said, "Okay, but how many potatoes do you have to eat to get your daily amount Dose. of vitamin C? 2 yeah. 2 yeah. kilos." Well, that's a rough amount of <laughs> <laughs> for a day. Yes. Yeah. Okay, but anyway, And then I worked as an English teacher mm. which a lot of foreigners and a lot of people from America or Britain mm. do but I didn't do that until after 20 years or so. Mm. And then I've been an interpreter translator. Mm. Uh and then the last 20 years I've been a social worker. Mm. And I worked as uh, a counselor mm. at a reception center for for asylum seekers mm. for eight years and then 10 year last 10 years in a uh, multicultural children's home okay uh what kind of so children's home what does it mean it's uh children who have been taken into care mm. by the social office for various reasons yes okay so before this 48 did you say 48 years 45 45 yeah. yeah okay uh before this how did you end up in this random country called Finland that nobody really knows yeah. much uh, some people knows not even not even some of my relatives who are wi- world travelers mm. you know they said does do any trees grow there mm, you know yeah. and, and, <laughs> 70% and, pretty and, much is forest right yeah right and are there <laughs> polar bears Yeah, we don't have them. No, we don't. I don't know if we want to have those cuz no, no. you know like they're nice creatures but they're very vicious, right? Yes. We have some normal bears. Yeah. Are they grizzlies here? No, the brown bears. Bar- brown bears. Yeah. Well, anyway, so uh I came into a small amount of money 
and I've always wanted to see the world. Okay. And I ha had a choice between New Caledonia, Japan, and Finland, okay. and I could afford to come to Finland. Okay. And so, knowing nothing, I How came. How old were you? I was just turning 21. Well, that's pretty brave. If you think about back in the days, like, you couldn't, like, inform your relatives that where are you or what are you doing and whatnot. No. And, and back in the day, this is back in the early 70s, uh, there were very few foreigners mm. in Finland. Mm. Mostly diplomats. There were, if you saw a black person or a color, a person of any other color than white, yeah. it was amazing. Mm. And they were mostly African students who were studying in the Soviet Union. Oh, my my parents came as as a student to Finland uh, in eighty nine. Okay, well that was much <laughs> later, <laughs> much later. Yeah, so uh, so I've seen a lot of change in Finland mm. in forty five years. A lot of change, positive and, or negative? Oh, definitely positive. Okay, definitely positive. I mean. A lot of people can grouse or, you know, complain about how things are going not so well or mm. there's racism or there's there's not so so much uh, possibilities for foreigners here. But I think there is. Mm. And I think the attitudes have changed. Mm. Because when we talk about integration mm. into a community... It's usually about 90% on the foreigner. But it's also 10% on the majority of the population. Mm. And for the foreigner to change, you also have to change the population. And I think it has changed, and for the better. Mm. The You know, the word integration is not that great of a word, because it means... In my ears and many other people's, it sounds like, well, if you come to my house, you need, you need to act the way I want you to act or the way everyone else acts in this house. Do you understand what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah. you need to change for me to accept you. Well, that's why I said mm. that the majority of the population also has to change. Mm. They have to become acceptant. Mm. Uh, for instance... Uh, I started my work at the Center for Asylum Seekers in 1999, which was the year of the Kosovo crisis. Mm. And actually, I started work a month before I graduated because mm. it happened just then. Mm. And the good thing about that is that it got the Finnish people willing to come out of their 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 quiet little houses mm. and meet these people to meet them halfway, to uh, offer them their friendship, mm. their services, their jobs, uh, their families. Mm. And this just opened up doors in mm. Finland. It was a terrible thing, of course, mm. for them to go through that war, to go through those, those mm. troubles. But it did wonders for Finland. Yeah, I think uh, with any kind of relationship, there is always a give and take, right? Mm. And we tend to think about foreigners or refugees, especially about refugees, that what are the values that they're bringing here? Like, I'm, I'm not talking about values like what you believe in and, and this kind of stuff, but more like, hey, you're not bringing any money or any education to here. We, as a Finnish people, are giving you more than you can actually give us. Isn't this like the way human beings think overall. I'm not talking about specifically Finnish uh, society, but any kind of society when neighboring countries are having wars or something and you have refugees coming over. That's a very narrow view. Uh, but and is I it, think... Is no, it no. that the like narrative that we have in the media and everywhere? Uh, or how do you see this whole thing? Can refugees bring something? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Uh because it's important nowadays, especially, to be aware of other people, how they think, how they feel, how they react. And in the long run, they're just like us. They're mm. just, we're all the same. 
We have we want to love, we want to be happy. Attention. Yeah, attention. We want our children to grow up safe. We want to be healthy.、Mm. A little money would be nice, but yeah. <laughs> As the Finns say, "Tili tuli, tili mene." <laughs> <laughs> you have been quite well integrated in, into the Finnish society. Did you have any struggles or challenges、oh. when you moved here, or what were some of the challenges? Oh, a lot of challenges and struggles.、Uh, one of the first things you learn, of course, I was young. You know, my first time out of my own country、mm. in uh, in. Uh, Uh, a place where I didn't know the language. That's and where nobody knew my language.、Mm. In other words, they would say, oh, "Well, I studied English for ten years, but no, I don't speak it."、Mm. So, yeah,、uh, one of my first challenges was that I'm not living in the United States anymore, and I have to change my habits. What were the habits that you had to change? I, well, I was living with a very nice elderly couple. Mm. In one room in their apartment,、um, and I invited a friend over、mm. to spend the night,、mm. a girlfriend. And in Finland, yeah, okay. And my landlady got、mm. very upset because I did not ask her permission.、Mm. Yeah, that's、um, it's kind of a boundary issue, right? Yeah, kind personal of personal space and and whatnot. Yeah. So I was automatically just yeah sure you know three or four people overnight you know、mm. I've got an extra mattress、mm. fine. So you were living in this one bedded apartment, but it was couple... just no, it was just one room. Okay, in their apartment,、you. yes.、Oh, okay, yeah, I and、see. I had to.、Uh, I had to be very careful when I went to the toilet. I couldn't use their kitchen, but I was working in、mm. a kitchen at that、mm. point, so it was no problem. No, you don't need extra time in a kitchen after work. <laughs> no, no, no. So there was that, and then of course learning the language.、Mm. How long do you think it took for you to learn Finnish? I didn't have any formal training. Yeah. Because at that time there was only university courses. Every now and then I was living in Turku,、mm. but I pick up languages very well. I speak five. Okay, which, which is un,、uh, I speak of course English, Finnish, French, Russian. Wow. And mime. Mime. I'm、Tell、very good at waving, waving my hands around and getting eye contact and、uh, explain. Ah, mime like a mime person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. right. Body language or body language. Non-verbal -ver communication. Well, very good at that. <laughs> That's、um, interesting way of looking at things. So, uh, uh, where did you learn Russian? I learned、uh, Russian in university. I attended in the United States two years.、Hmm. I also lived in Russia、uh, for a year and a half. Okay, back to the main point. Okay, how but, did you know Finland overall from all the way from United States? I had a friend who came here. Okay, and I kind of followed him. Okay, I mean he was a friend, friend,、mm. friend. You know, nothing special. Be, nothing special. Yeah, and、uh, they needed Baha'is here. I came for the Baha'i faith,、mm. and pretty much stayed.、Mm. How long have you been Baha'i? I've been a Baha'i、uh, about forty-six years. Forty-six years. Okay, just before you came to Finland. Yeah, but I had heard about it since I was twelve. Okay, so that's our, another long story. Yeah, yeah, but just a small question in between: Is Baha'i faith big on USA? Yeah, it is. Okay, especially in the southern states. Okay. Oh. And and among the minority populations,、mm. which minority population、uh, represents the, the most? Afri African Americans. African Americans. For, for instance, in the state of South Carolina, they're the second largest religious group. Really. Right.、Nice. After the Christians is、okay. are the Baha'is. Yeah, I like Baha'is faith, especially the couple of things. One, they don't try to convert people. Okay, and the second one is that they have this community role or community service that they have, which is pretty good. I mean, I think 
even if you are not a Baha'i, anyone can benefit and, and should have those morals in them to make the world a better place. Mm-hmm. Those are the things that, you know, like kind of, um, that I remember whenever I talk about Baha'i faith. Mm. So you came in uh, to Finland as a, you know, uh, like a, a, pi- fa- a pioneer, they call it. And mm. I'm not supported by anybody. I had to find my own jobs, mm. support myself, learn the language, learn the customs, and and um, find my own balance. But I think that took me some time. Did you ever regret why did I came to this place? It's so cold. <laughs> I didn't mind winter until I bought a car. <laughs> That's true. I mean, cars makes winter so much easier. To no, bear. it was scarier. I had to yeah. drive on ice. Eee. Yeah, and back in the days they used to have like real winters, not like nowadays. Like it's mm-hmm. almost. Well, I lived eight years in Rovaniemi. Oh, there are like more secrets coming. The more we talk, the more secrets I'm learning from you, yeah. you know, about you. <laughs> I don't have any secrets. Wait, wait a sec. <laughs> <laughs> but should we continue on the next clip? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you mentioned that you worked as a counselor. Mm-hmm. And um, you were, before we made this podcast, we were discussing that a lot of your colleagues were calling you helper, but you didn't like that word. Why? Well, a helper sort of is like giving somebody a bowl of soup. Yeah. Or helping a little old lady walk across the street. You're doing it for them. Whereas a counselor gives you advice, gives you the tools, gives you the remedies, Mm -hmm. even listens to you. Mm. I think that's important to give you the the opportunity to make whatever you need to make. So would you say you cultivate more than actually help, like cultivating the the person who you, who you are working with? Yeah. So you were working with kids? Yeah, sorry, you were saying. Yeah, well, I worked with adults and children. My last job, I was working specifically with children, but also we worked with the families. We did mm. family work. We're talking about kids who have to be removed from their family environment because it's not safe overall, right? Would you say? or There are various reasons. Various reasons. But it it's, has to... it's either safe or the family cannot handle them. Yeah. You know, teenage angst mm. is not easy. So how did you find, like, because, you know, a lot of the time, like, I try to help people as as much as I can. And sometimes I, this was like the discussion that we were having in in uh, Inca's place, mm-hmm. that my argument is more like people have to realize that they need help and try to help themselves instead of like, if you have a problem, right, financial issue, and you're not taking care of your own finances, you're not even trying to take care of your finances, or you don't even understand that it's your finances that needs to be fixed, then it doesn't matter how much money I pour into you because you're not dealing the issue, which is within yourself. Mm. And you were... It's not so specific, but overall I'm saying that people should try to help themselves first and then move on. It's always your own help that matters the most and you were saying that people need more love Mm -hmm. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong (laughs) no no I mean that's one of the things but um, I think the thing is is uh, that we tend to put ourselves into compartments or we tend to trivialize or make simplify simplify yes our problems if I had a thousand euros, all my problems would go away. Yeah. No. (laughs) No. Because then what you're not really looking at is your real down deep. Why are you unhappy? 
Mm. And will money make you happy? Well, maybe not. I had a. I was actually discussing about the money issue. Now that yeah. we're talking about money, so a friend of mine was saying. I said, like, look, money doesn't make you happy. And then he said, yeah, but think about any problem you have. And if I drop you one million, would you have that problem? You know, that was his argument. It kind of does sound okay. You understand what I mean? Money is a very crucial part of the life. I don't know. This kind of went in a weird way. But he, his argument was like, any problem you have, if I put a million dollar, you won't have that problem. Mm. Remind- is that a bold statement? <laughs> it's, a, it's a fallacy. That mm. means it's not quite going to hold water. Mm. Because in the end, you don't take it with you. True. In the end, your little body goes into dust, you know, and you're buried with great honor and everybody cries and forgets you. Yeah, if they do. If you have even people around you that yeah. will cry for you. <laughs> yeah. So the thing is, is... Are material things the most important things in life? Well, this is the way the world functions, pretty much. Uh, the only reason why I go to work or people get up in the morning, for some of, some of us and most of us, is the job to keep this house running, household running. Yeah, but that's a very Western idea. Yeah, it is. But that's being kind of propagated everywhere, wouldn't yeah, you say? Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm not going to deny that. I mm. mean, the thing is, we're living in a very materialistic society. Mm. But the thing is that uh, uh, materialism isn't everything. Yeah, it's good to be rich. Mm. Yeah, it's nice to have a nice home mm. and have things, and there's nothing wrong with that. Mm. Do you share it? Yes. I think you do. Mm. Uh if you see your brother is hungry, mm. do you feed him? Yeah. Yeah, right. If you see somebody across the world is hungry, mm. do you feed them? Yeah, I try to. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, though, usually, you know, it's across the world, and if you give money to some aid agency, you heaven knows where it's going to. Yeah, you just hope that it goes there. Yeah. So, the point is that what we have to do is get down to grassroots to a neighborhood idea. Mm. And that's sort of what we're doing here in Kon- what I'm doing here in Kondula. Mm. To to meet people face to face to say, well look, what can I do to help you? Mm. But do they know what like what's their problem? So like when I I go to the doctors, I'm having a headache. Yeah. But it turns out to be a tumor or it mm. turns out to be worse than what it is. You understand what I mean? Yeah. So how do you convince someone, like, look, yeah, you have a problem in your headache, but it's more serious than that. Well, that's a job for a doctor. Yeah, not, yeah, yeah. Not but, me, but I'm but... saying, like, in a, in a similar way, the spiritual or the well-being, when, or how do you help people, like, in your gatherings? and? I think the thing is that, that you have to be sensitive to people, especially when you're working with somebody who you don't know their language or with children who are unable to express res- express mm. what has happened to them. Yeah. And for this, and you have to look at people. Mm. You have to see them. You know, nowadays we just sort of, you know, oh, look at that pretty dress or, you know, or... He's a good-looking guy, you know, mm. that sort of thing, or mm. uh, I, you know, a crush on a movie star or something like that. Mm. We're we're looking very superficially. In Finnish, they say pin on the surface. Yeah, yeah. Mm. So to look deeper at people, mm. and people are very unhappy these days. What do you think is the root root cause why people are unhappy? What causes that unhappiness they're not well they're not satisfied with where they are and what they're doing Mm. um i think that's one of the keys that i found some 20 years ago actually Mm. when i 
divorced my no good husband <laughs> <laughs> and found that I was a stronger person than I realized. Mm. And I liked who I saw. Within yourself? Within myself. What did you discover? I discovered that I had potential. Mm. I had strength. Mm. I had humor. Mm. You have a crazy humor. Yes. I really appreciate that. Yeah. I think humor overall is like these small things in life that makes life enjoyable. Yeah. Uh, in the right, the right realms, I guess. <laughs> yeah. When, uh, whenever our kids at our, our workplace would mm. act up or they would be throwing a tantrum, one of my workmates and I would start dancing together. Mm. Okay. And they would just stop. <laughs> and look at us. What are you guys doing? Oh, we're crazy. <laughs> <laughs> and and yeah, that would work. That would work. Mm. But back to the point. Yeah, but uh, yeah, mm. I think people tend to compartmentalize themselves. Mm. They they put themselves in a box and say, "This is my work box." Mm. And in work, I'm the sufficient, you know, kind. I have to be nice to the customer. This mm. yada yada. At home, I beat my wife, you know, and on my free days, I go out swearing and drinking, mm. you know. And then on Sunday, I, every other now and then, I go to church, mm. and then I feel good. I do For the same, day. but I beat Zubair, who's behind the camera. Yeah, yeah, but, <laughs> yeah, but you anyway. do it legally. You do it nicely. With, with uh, consent. <laughs> with consent, yes. Now, that's a strange relationship. Isn't that... <laughs> We have a crazy relationship with him. But, yeah, so you were saying that that's like a typical person. Yeah, in, in and the thing is, what I did is I brought all those compartments together. Gail is always Gail. Yeah. I treat my kids, I raise my kids on my own. In my workplace, I'm the same. At home, in my free time, I am who I am, and I'm happy. Yeah. Um, I have a little button that I have at home. It says, I know my role, who I am, and what I do matters. Mm. And I had 10 of them at one point, but all my colleagues took them away. Yeah, you need they, to give one of those to me. I have only one left. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but that's that's me. Okay. I know my role. Mm. My role is to help people. Mm. My role is to be of service mm. to humanity by helping individuals, by being a good a person as I can, yeah. which is, you know, it works sometimes, sometimes it doesn't. I think we are doesn't. all working progress. Yeah, that's the thing, is that it, it doesn't stop. Mm. A lot of people think, oh, I'm 18, now I'm an adult, mm. I, ha I have an education, I have a job, you know, that's it. Mm. Do you, now that you help everyone, but do you need help? Mm -hmm. How do you know? Like how, how does one know that I need help? I think it takes a, a lot of courage to admit that I need help or to, you know, look, look, look at the mirror and be realistic. Yeah, it, it, it does sometimes because sometimes what you see in the mirror is not quite what you wanted to see. Yeah. Because I think of myself when I was married and I saw a, a small person who was under the thumb mm. of another person mm. and who did not have an opinion that was valid. Mm. That's sad. There's yeah. so many people who are in that those kind of relationship. And to be honest, I don't I don't want to like break anyone's relationship because that's you know their business you know who you want to be with it's like if someone is like cutting themselves up you know the wrist and whatnot it's well, well, not kind of my business if they're being in a toxic relationship or having a toxic you know behavior there is some there there is a limit that i can tell them like hey maybe you shouldn't be cutting yourself mate but there is the boundary that i can't I can't really go I can't really hold you or, you know, tie your hands like this, you know, metaphorically. So how do you help someone like that? So you have a lot of those kind of cases in your work. So basically the kid is, is being in an unsafe 
environment or environment which is not suitable for the kid and you can't and it's kind of a family thing right uh, i wouldn't allow if i have like a kid i wouldn't allow another man or a woman or anyone to come like hey this is how you should be ra raising kids and we all tend to know like hey i know the best but the fact of the reality is nobody goes through a course to become a parent right well they should <laughs> <laughs> or you would wish they did mm. it, parenting is is tough it's not easy you do your best and Each hope. case is different the yeah. temperaments and what well that. it's like i told my boys at, at some point i said sooner or later your mother's going to do something really stupid in your mind or really horrible in your mind and you're going to hate what i did mm. and i and i said that's okay trust in god mm. you, if you have if you have trust in god who is a higher power and will not let you down Mm. then that's okay because people will mm. and and relationships are difficult yeah and a lot of people go into them with this sort of birds are singing little hearts floating around and and all that which are unrealistic mm. and then when they hit a difficult spot they say it's over mm. was was that life before like back in the days w was it like this because we I think you just described the current state of Well, it's people. been like that for 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 some 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 years. I mean, I, mm. always before uh the family is one of the building blocks of society. Mm. And it's been crumbling around us for many decades. And what we have to do is rebuild our whole idea of of family what are the rights and responsibilities of all members of the family mm. the children also have rights but they also have responsibilities mm. but how do you go about fixing one's family because you know it's a very private thing right like i said like i don't like we tend to think like team khan versus the rest of the world i um i once listened to uh, a lady who's a uh, specialist in marriage counseling her name was agnes gasnaby and especially with multicultural marriages which are interracial so -called. interracial yeah. intercultural yeah and she says you cannot change the other person what you can change is the relationship mm. and it's a give and take yeah and you have to grow with each other yeah yeah but but then again it <laughs> I mean it's it's such a complicated issue because when do you know that I have to now give or when do you know that I have to now take and it has to be like in a synchronism you know with the other person <laughs> that, I guess that's the challenge of of marriage you haven't been married I have actually yeah, okay all right <laughs> uh yeah it is well if with any relationship yeah i mean with your brother mm. right i uh, you have a different kind of relationship with him and sometimes it's good yeah sometimes you just as soon probably not <laughs> i think one of the things that i find very um troublesome with with especially with the family ties when it comes to my brothers or sisters or my parents right i want them uh, i don't have kids not that i know of anyway <laughs> so um the the problem is we always like them to do the right decisions and right kind of lifestyle issues so i would like my parents to eat healthy and exercise but when it comes to me then it's like eh i'll do it tomorrow eh i will do it later or whatever i'm sipping coke right now yeah yeah <laughs> oh that's my fault i mentioned coke <laughs> <laughs> that is fine so uh, yeah so why don't we basically say that hey i'm going to live my life like i wish my kid to live theirs Yeah, you have to be a good example. Mm. And uh you have to be a good example throughout everything. Mm. Throughout everything. Because all you have to do especially in my my workplace, the one time I swore. The one time I swore. Which one was it? <laughs> it, it, it It's fine. I'm just Yeah, joking. yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh one of the kids picked it up. and carried it 
for years. Oh, Gail so. once said, Gail, I heard Gail said, <laughs> Gail swears, yeah. <laughs> and, and you know, and if you have one bad habit, the kid will pick it up. But mm. also, parent, one of the things that kids have to realize, and this was a shock for me as a, as a young person, mm. was that my parents were people. Mm. And they, they weren't perfect. Mm. Because as a young person, you put your parents up on a pedestal. You know, this is my mom and dad. You know, mm. they raise me. They give me all this. Mm. And, you know, and they're perfect and they know everything. And then all of a sudden you find out, no, they're not. They have problems. They have bad days. Mm. How long have you lived in Gondola? Uh, since March 15th. So not very long. Okay. Was it a conscious decision? <laughs> yes, it was. Yes, it was. Actually. For those who are English listeners, Kontola is basically known to be, how would you describe it? Mm, sort of the armpit of Helsinki. Yeah, why armpit? Because it stinks. <laughs> yeah, that was its reputation, you know, it's sort of... But I, also I lived for two years in Corso, which is supposed to be the armpit of Vanta. And everybody was saying, oh, of course, so, you know, the, the drug dealers on every corner, you know, this sort mm. of thing. It wasn't like that. Mm. And I don't think you can say the th same thing about Kontula. Yeah. yeah, there's a lot of different nationalities here, but I think that's great. I thrive in this kind of I don't think the nationality is necessarily the problem. The problem is, uh, especially when it comes to the shopping center and the metro area, that's a place like... Very rarely in Finland, I have to really look look back at myself, like who's following me or who's around me. But that's one of those places, like I actually look through the windows or different reflective things that is anyone trying to make a move on me. Not because it might happen, it hasn't happened so far. There was once um, a person, I'm not going to say the nationality, was trying to pick up a fight with me. But I think they were like heavily dosed with some kind of a drug. And, and he was like, hey, do you want to fight me? And I was like, then I was like, no, I don't want. I was like, don't you think you're a big of a man? I was like, no, I'm not. And then I was like, okay, fine. And then I just left. Because, okay. you know, I don't like, I tend to hold my ego down as, as much as I can. And, you know, the, the process that I go in my head is like, okay, if I beat him up, will that make me feel better? No. If I get beaten by him, will that make me feel better? No. What's the point, <laughs> you know, and uh, that's me, but there's a lot of people who might not be able to control themselves, right? No, but anyway, back to the point, Kontula is one of those places in Finland, that not the whole of it, just the certain areas uh, where they have neola pista, you know, like uh, people who use heavy drugs with mm -hmm. needles, they get to change into the new ones so that they don't spread the... Hepatitis, you know, yeah. Or any kind of diseases that might come from there. So you choose to come here? Yeah, I did. Uh, I retired in February. Mm. And I was living with a friend of mine for two mm. years. We were sharing an apartment because it was cheaper. Mm. But I knew that I wanted to live again on my own. Mm. So I, I enjoyed living with my friend, but it was time for me to move. And I was thinking, well, where do I want to go? Mm. And at that time in, in December, there was a, a special project here in Kontula. Mm. And I went out with two little girls. One of them was, you met Sydney, yeah. her little sister Paris, who was a real pistol. And, uh, They're both awesome girls. <laughs> yeah, and uh, a little girl from Norway okay. who was visiting, because I know that kids are really good mm -hmm. to work with. So we went out and we handed out invitations to people for th this sort of family gathering, mm -hmm. and talked to people on the streets and Finnish people as well. Mm -hmm. And I found people receptive mm -hmm. and interested and wanting to know about things like prayer, the education of children, uh, mm. what is important in life. What is important in life? 
the uh, what is the meaning of life? Yes, yes to tell know, us, oh yeah, great to know. sage. <laughs> <laughs> I am not a great sage. The purpose of life is to know and love God and to carry on an ever advancing civilization. But everything ends with the death. What's no, it doesn't. Point? We go on, we go on. Well, I, well, there are a lot of people who will say, like, I, see, I haven't seen anyone moving on from the grave. Oh, well, only our souls. I mean, we're not going to you know, be an army of zombies or anything like that. That would be creepy though. Yeah, sure it would. <laughs> I know they're very, they're very popular now, all these zombie movies, but I don't like horror films. Uh, I don't either. They, they kind of scare me. But the thing is that Kontula, I mean, I worked in a reception center for eight years. Mm. And I stood between fighting groups of people armed with hockey sticks and baseball bats and made them stand down because mm. I'm a little old lady. Mm. I get away with that. And this is which year? That was in 1999 to uh, 2007. Yeah, like I, I remember like my elder brother when he was like in those era he was like in his teenagers and he said that back in the days you know you had to really you know as a foreigner or someone who's um, people of color you had to like gang up when you go out in a certain time because otherwise there might be like some skinheads or really wants to beat you just for being brownish yeah you uh, well of course you know I'm white mm. What can I say? I'm sorry. No, I'm not blaming yeah, yeah, it's, no, not, it's not like your fault. <laughs> no, but the thing is even... Uh, so I don't have that problem, mm. so, so to speak. Yeah. And I also am not too afraid of getting involved. I've done first aid. We have a gangster first, here. <laughs> yeah. uh, no, you have somebody who, who will step in and yell at people. <laughs> that takes a lot of courage because you know there are a lot of times when I see something horrible happen and I'm, I'm not really sure should I step in or not because you know like it's kind of out of comfort zone not for myself but you know I might actually make the thing even worse. No that's true you have to know what you're c kind of doing. Yeah yeah you don't want to make the whole you know situation worse than what it is. No no but like I said I've been doing I did first aid for so many years, uh. and when I worked in the reception center, I lived right around the corner. Mm. So I was often called in to do stuff. And then it was in the middle of nowhere, this little place called Punkalayu, mm. which is seriously in the middle of nowhere. Okay. And the thing is that we would call up the police. There'd be two of us women on, on, on duty, and we'd say, well, the Afghans and the Russians are fighting. Mm. Well, we can get somebody there in a couple hours. Do you think you guys can manage? All right. <laughs> all right, let's roll up the sleeves. <laughs> yeah, right. Let's go to work. Go there with the fry pan and say, all right, you guys, you know, settle down. Who wants a piece of this? <laughs> <laughs> no, but, you know, if we had men workers there. But mm. if they got it into a fight it mm. would it wouldn't be a good deal because people weren't afraid of them but they were afraid of little old ladies like me mm. because they had respect yeah for thank god they had even that yeah, you know, yeah. some people don't even have that yeah and and in a sense like i said i've, I've done first aid and if i see somebody who's hurt i mm. will step in mm. but i'm not stupid either Mm, yeah, you have to know where the limit kind of goes. Yeah. And that's kind of hard. That's one of the things that I say to, to my friends, like an advice. Never ulluta. You know what's ulluta? Overstep what's, yourself. Yeah. Or, or overreach. Or, yeah, or more like, you know, like, oh, what you gonna do? Huh? Never do that to another person because you never know how, how much of a nutcase the other person is. They might actually kill you. So there are some people 
who you know like they might be in a verge of not killing you and you just like what you're gonna do oh well that's you understand that's yeah. never in your favor to push another person to you know to act out that's no, that's no, not no, a no. good idea and that kind of keeps you alive as well you know not doing that to people someone t overtakes you in a in a road so what i want to be safe i want to be live and healthy you know mm -hmm. i don't care you know they're endangering their own life so that's on them yeah. and i wish they wouldn't do that but i don't think they're gonna listen to me anyway <laughs> yeah. but Kontula, you ended up here so far you're liking it yes i am yeah and i i, I like Kontula as well every now and then you just hear some you know people yelling in the street like three o'clock in the morning but i guess it's uh, you know with everything there is a cons and pros to everything well, it's like the the first night that I spent in my apartment. Mm. I'm out in the hall and I go, weed. And did you go and knock them? Hey, can I get some? No, no, no. <laughs> well, I was a hippie chick, you know, peace, love, man. So I know what weed smells like. Mm. But, yeah. But uh, other than that, I mean, the neighbors are nice and... But don't you think, this is slightly a tangent, don't you think like alcohol is far more worse than weed when it comes to the consequences and things that people do? All of, all of those that alter your mind mm. are, are not necessarily good for you. Now, on the other hand, uh, weed does have medical properties. Yeah, CBD and, oil. Yeah, 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 which is very good for certain people and certain diseases. And if, mm. it's, if it's ordered by a doctor, fine. Mm. You know, if it's legal, it's fine. If it's illegal, it's not. One of the big problems I've noticed... So the thing that something is okay to do, it, it depends on the legality? Uh, y yes. Basically, we deciding what is right and what is wrong. Sorry, I'm just getting into deep <laughs> discussion. No, no, it's, it's, a, it's yeah. all right. I mean, like if you disobey traffic laws, yeah. you can speed. Yeah. Sure, you can speed. But, you know, you become a traffic statistic. Mm, mm, mm. Where were you going? Or you get a ticket, which mm. is even worse, because it costs a whole mess of money nowadays. Yeah. So, the thing is that uh, what I've seen, mm. and especially working first aid and among young people, is that mixed usage, where they're mixing drugs and alcohol, and mm. that really kills brains cells yeah. it's been proven of course I'm not saying and not promoting people to do any kind of drugs I think people should be high on life just mm -hmm. living it you know you should always not always but you should try to do things that makes you feel overwhelmed in a positive way so you feel like you're alive a lot mm -hmm. of people do drugs or alcohol well go back to the party we were we met at oh my days i was so that was so high. fun yeah that not was... on drugs or anything but it was so fun and and like i took a picture of the wall which yeah. said like things the commandments that we were supposed to do yeah. like ask each other things it was uh, overwhelming and I was really energized after I left. No hangover, yeah. more like a positive hangover, you know, yeah. having like a positive energy and, you know, feeling revitalized in, in, a, in, a, in a way and having like really healthy food, you know, African, African food. Mm -hmm. Very delicious. And mm -hmm. There's more parties coming over. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to be there terrorizing you guys. <laughs> <laughs> But my point was that I was trying to make is that there are people who only smoke weed or consume marijuana or whatever you want to call it and then there are people who drink. I, in, my, in my personal observation I think like people who only use marijuana are far less dangerous and, and, and kind of you know like, like they just lay, lay down and they eat you know food and, and talk funny. But then you have like alcohol, which is a root of many violence, rape, and, and you know, people like doing horrible things to each other. And I had less a, of a control. I had a good friend in high school who killed three of his friends while high on weed. Really? He crashed his car. Three, and, oh, yeah, yeah. Well, he shouldn't be driving anyway. You're not supposed to drive when you're drinking as well. Yeah, well, that, but the does thing that is, make 
Is that the weed's fault, though? Yeah, it was. Uh, well, and, I think it can be And it's a sad thing, you know. Yeah, the thing course. is, there's always a point. And the thing is that anything that's illegal mm. is, not, is not legal for a reason. Yeah, but is that a good, or not, good of an well, argument? Well, if you don't like it, change the law. No, I'm not. I'm not saying that. But you know, like overall, if you think about that as an argument, that if you don't, if, if there is a reason why certain things are illegal. Exactly. Well, back in the days, there were some you know laws that were not really good. You know, like people used to burn witches and and do those were legal acts right there, right? So you you see where I'm coming from. I'm saying like they're not so simple as we make them to be. But no, that's I... because we have to carry on our civilization much higher. Mm. And the thing is that a lot of our laws, I mean, there's there's some really old laws mm. on the books, I know, in the United States that are absolutely hilarious. Mm. You know, the things that you cannot uh, walk a horse down Main Street, you know, in certain towns because it's illegal. Yeah, it's, it's not like... Yeah, or a parade, have a parade, you know, with banners, because it might frighten the horses. Mm. Interesting. <laughs> you know, these are old ones that nobody's bothered to, mm. to change to or change. update. Mm. So the thing is that the laws that we need to have are the ones that tell us to do things, mm. like to be kind to people, mm. to treat people fairly, mm. to not cheat. Mm. Not let ourselves be cheated. Yeah. This sort of things. Uh, to be uh, faithful, to work. To have some virtues. Would you yeah, have to, to have virtues, to have good things. Yeah. I think that's one of the things that I liked about the Baha'i Faith was that most of the laws that we have are these positive things. Be kind to animals. Mm. Uh, find a, a work that will be of service to humanity, mm. which is one of the reasons why I went into social work, is mm. that I knew I could be of service to humanity. Plus, you knew it kind of resonates with you. Yeah. Some other people are being doing the same service by building, you know, buildings or you know, yeah. taking care of computer programs because mm -hmm. they also solve or has a, have a role in our civilization. Mm -hmm. um, is there anything else you want to cover or say? Something no. you missed out on now the final message that I want you to say to give a message. What would you say to a younger version of yourself? Um, ooh, that's deep. Believe in yourself know that things will work out and save a bit more money. <laughs> <laughs> I need to write those down and do those things. Ladies and gentlemen, Gail, awesome person and thank you for tolerating me yeah. and my nonsense yeah, <laughs> and you're it? always welcome to my house and if there is anything I can do for you, let me know. I would love to do this again. We will do many, many in the future. Okay, great. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Gail, for an awesome interview. I want to thank also the cameraman behind the scene, Khan Vision, Niloy Khan, and shout out to my friend, Gim. Gim makes beats for my podcast. Check him out. There's a link where you can listen to rest of his beats and remember to subscribe if you haven't and share this podcast with your friend on social media 